It's a huge pleasure to be here. I really enjoy these interactions between academics and practitioners. And as Stan says, before I actually go into the evidence for the link between corporate governance and shareholder returns, I want to take a step back and ask, what is corporate governance to begin with? Because I might actually convey a different view to what we typically see in the media. So here's an example of a news event which was seen to be really bad corporate governance by many people. This was the pay of uh, Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney. This was seen to be extortionate. So he received 1,424 times the median employee. Yes, we think CEOs add some value, but over 1,000 times, this is surely excessive. And even Abigail Disney, the heir to the Disney fortune, said that this was insane, calling for a crackdown on the levels of CEO pay. And this is not an isolated case, right? If you were to stop any person in the street and ask him or her why capitalism is not working for the ordinary person, they would just point to the extortionate levels of CEO pay. And we're looking to, as Henri suggested, investors to crack down on pay. But this story is actually much more nuanced than one might think. Because if you look at the performance of Disney, actually Disney's market value rose just in the prior month by $75 billion. Now, clearly, he was not the only person to contribute to this. There was other employees and so forth. But even if he added only 1% of that $75 billion, now his $66 million doesn't seem too excessive. And clearly, we don't just want to look at short-term performance. We want to look at long-term performance. But if you look at that, the stock price was 24 when he arrived. It was 130 at the time of this seemingly excessive pay. And as we mentioned in terms of the business roundtable statement, maybe we don't just care about shareholder returns. We also care about what happened in terms of society and stakeholders. But even then, it seems that Bob Iger did create value. So there were 70,000 jobs created and customers benefited. So there were top quality products and services, for example, the integration of creative engines, the Disney Plus subscription. So it didn't seem that this was actually stealing at the expense of performance. This was a byproduct of sustainable good performance. But this is quite different from a lot of the narrative we see about pay. A lot of the narrative that we see is based on the idea that the more you give the CEO, the worse for other people. You're taking money away from wages or from potential investments in reducing your carbon emissions. So the AFL-CIO, the um, equivalent of the TUC in the US, they launch this um, executive pay watch every year under the banner, more for them, less for us. And indeed, in both the UK and the US, now you have to disclose the pay ratio between the CEO and the average worker. And this is based on the idea that there is a fixed pie that a company generates. So anything that you give to executives is at the expense of investors and, more importantly, perhaps wider society. And so that's why we care about the pay ratio. If it's high, the CEO is taking too much of the pie at the expense of ordinary workers. And if that is the case, good corporate governance is to redistribute the pie, give less to the executive so that there's more to go for everybody else. And what I've talked about is the pie split between CEOs and everyone else, but we can also think about how the pie is split between investors and other stakeholders. So again, if you want to look at examples of poor corporate governance or capitalism not working for ordinary people, you can look at this Time article. Every 60 seconds, Apple makes more money than you do in a year. And you can go into this website and actually see other large companies, and those numbers rise in real time as you browse the website to perhaps fuel envy that they're just making this money at the expense of you. And, and this is why, as Henri suggested, we have things like the Business Roundtable statement suggesting we want to redistribute the pie away from investors and towards other stakeholders. And in his Q&A, he mentioned governments see investors as being responsible for implementing public policy initiatives. Perhaps investors should encourage companies to make less money and instead redistribute this money towards climate change and so forth, because investors should perhaps feel embarrassed that they're earning profits at the expense of everybody. But that is not my view as to what corporate governance is. It's not about redistributing a fixed pie towards stakeholders. It's instead an example of this. So we're casting our minds back to 1981, where Sony released the first, the Mavica, which is the first ever electronic camera. Now, if you were Kodak, 
would you respond to this? Well, Kodak sales had just crossed $10 billion, nearly all from film. Now, Kodak had every opportunity to respond to this threat. After all, Kodak had a patent for the digital camera. It invented it in 1975. Do you want to know what one looks like? You've probably got a sleek um, camera on your phone, but this is what it looked like back then. Not hugely useful to taking selfies, but they did have the potential to develop this into something which was to rival the Mavica. But there was just no need to do that, right? The idea of, of short-termism and long-termism that Henri talked about is really pertinent. So they, their own study suggested that digital would replace film. But it would take 10 years, and if, if you were paid according to short-term performance, maybe it wasn't worth making that investment. And we all know how this movie ended, right? Kodak went bankrupt in 2012. This was a disaster for society, not only for shareholders, the company was worth $31 billion in its heyday, but also for employees, 145,000 people used to depend on Kodak for their livelihood and, and their purpose in life. Yet Kodak is rarely thought of an example of poor corporate governance. It's not thought of as badly as a CEO who overpays herself or a company that engages in a share buyback. Why? Nobody lined their pockets at the expense of society. Nobody trousered a massive bonus. CEOs and investors both lost. But the fact that investors also lost does not make it any better for the employees who lost their jobs. So what I'm going to argue is poor corporate governance is the idea of shrinking the pie, and good corporate governance is the idea of growing the pie. So if a company is great if it's innovative, then it does create more value for society, and investors do benefit, and the CEO is well paid, such as Bob Iger. But if these profits and this high pay is as a result of creating value, we don't need to be embarrassed for those profits and for those bonuses. And in contrast, poor corporate governance is allowing the pie to shrink. And even if the CEO is not well paid, and even if there are no profits, this still could be an example of just allowing a company to be complacent. So if we think about there's two mistakes that a company can make, we can think about errors of commission, which is where you do something which people see to be bad. You overpay the CEO or you engage in a share buyback. That's what we think of being poor corporate governance. But instead, what I'd like to change the conversation to is errors of omission. If you fail to take risks, if you fail to innovate, if you coast and hug the status quo, that is poor corporate governance. So what we should be about, you know, these other things such as um, climate change and, and, and fair pay, those are important. But really, I think good corporate governance is about promoting great companies. How can we create value to society through our core business? So if you take, say, Vodafone, they did one great thing. They, they produced the world's first tax transparency report in the telecoms industry. And fair tax is clearly important. But I think the best thing they did was through their core business, they innovated, they launched m in Kenya, a mobile money service which lifted 200,000 people out of poverty. We had the good question on CSR data. Maybe that innovation would not be captured by many CSR data sets, but I think that that's an example of a great company creating a lot of value for society. So um, let's now just get to, to, to the evidence. So does corporate governance add value? And as Henri was presenting for, for the E and the S, the evidence is actually much more nuanced than one might believe. So we need to be careful for any type of ESG investing, both the ENS that Henri referred to and the G that I'm talking about, because of this concern of confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is the tendency to accept uncritically any evidence that confirms what we would like to be true and to reject any evidence that contradicts it. And this is a particular issue for ESG investing because we would love to live in a world in which the ethical companies perform better. And also in terms of governance, people like to believe that shareholders are evil, shareholder activism is short-termist, and that's why we want to put companies in the hands of workers or wider society. And so as a result of that, then some poor papers might be lapped up uncritically. And indeed, I gave a TED talk about this a couple of years ago called What to Trust in a Post-Truth World, because confirmation bias is so severe, it is potentially affecting some of the laws and policies that get passed on ESG.
So let's just to give a, a couple of examples of, of why this, where this might be the case. Um, here was an, an article um, in a respected uh, outlet, Forbes, saying that one of the most comprehensive bodies of research on sustainability has landed. Companies that excel in their sustainability and responsibility outperform their peers and are susceptible to fewer risks from business disruption. This is the premise of a new report and is an accurate one. All of that is fine so far, but how do they define accurate? Judging by many conversations with those interested in better business, better corporate governance and a sustainable future. So they didn't look at the robustness or the statistical significance or correcting for data mining, many of the things that came up in the Q&A. They just asked people who believe in responsible business, do you like the findings? And obviously they're gonna say yes. And this is not just an isolated case. We do have a lot of studies trying to claim that the evidence is beyond doubt. Well, let's go to some of the evidence. And I'm gonna first start by some evidence in favor of the value of governance. And here's perhaps the most well-cited academic study on corporate governance, which looks at various protection mechanisms that companies can put in place in order to insulate themselves from shareholders. So one is the staggered board. So here, the board of directors elections is staggered so that only one third of the board comes up for election in any given year. So what this means is that the CEO is underperforming, an activist investor, can only get one third of the board seats and can't kick the CEO out. Now you might think, well, that's bad governance, but there is a flip side. What if you believe the CEO is really visionary, would like to pursue a long-term strategy, and activist investors are just short-termist? Well, then she would like to put in the staggered board so that she can focus on the long term without being worried about being kicked out for poor quarterly performance. And that is indeed some of the mantra in Silicon Valley, why some companies will go public with, say, few voting rights for outside investors. So who's right? Well, is it bad governance or is this long-term behavior? Well, that's the role of academic research to look at the evidence. And what this paper found was what seemed to be pretty unambiguous over the time period they studied, companies without protection mechanisms, like staggered boards, and they looked at 23 others, they outperformed their peers by 8.5% per year. But there is a twist. Right, so what they found was a result across all companies, but the evidence is actually not unambiguous. And this is why in order to put an ESG strategy in, we need to look at these nuances. So a follow-up paper by two faculty at NYU Stern looked at the industries in which governance mattered. And they said, well, actually, in certain industries, let's say a competitive industry, it doesn't matter how strong your governance is, because if there's strong industry competition, the CEO probably has to work hard, even if she's protected by a staggered board and all of the other entrenchment devices. So it's only in the non-competitive industries, let's say utilities, that governance matters. And I think this is important because how some investors implement governance, at ESG, is through one-size-fits-all strategies. If you don't tick a cer certain box, if you, if you do have a staggered board, you might be excluded. But actually, the relevance of these dimensions is actually situation specific. In some settings, actually, your governance might not matter. And so that was a, a paper in which good governance might not matter if the industry is competitive. And this paper here suggests that actually sometimes good governance might backfire. So they looked at companies where there was a large strategic alliance or a large customer or a dependent supplier. And what happens when these companies go public? And their idea was actually, you might want to put in takeover defenses and other protections. Otherwise, when you go public, atomistic investors who don't understand the value of those long-term relationships might encourage you to milk them by hiking up prices if to your customers. And what they found in the Journal of Financial Economics was that if and only if you have these strategic alliances, your value at IPO actually goes up with takeover defenses, even though we see these to be uh, poor governance. And that's why I think the implementation of governance in the UK is, is good, uh, that we have a comply and explain idea, because you might not want to comply with what is typically believed to be good governance, because in your specific context, there might be reasons to actually deviate. Now, those studies that I mentioned, those are correlations. 
But what about causality? I'm just going to mention the first paper here because I think it, it's really good and it shows how academic research can try to get a handle on these issues. So you might think, is it corporate governance that leads to better performance? Or a company that is performing well anyway is able to think about corporate governance. So what they looked at is they looked at shareholder proposals. So sometimes shareholders can propose to do things such as remove the staggered board or separate the CEO and the chairman. Now, if we found that a shareholder proposal led to an improvement in long-term performance, it's hard to ascribe causality because shareholder proposals to improve governance don't arise randomly. It may well be that the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund made this shareholder proposal, but the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund is a good active investor anyway, and maybe it was the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund's monitoring in general that led to the high performance rather than the proposal in particular. So what they did is what's known as a regression discontinuity. They compared some governance proposals which passed with just 51% of the vote to those which just failed with 49% of the vote. So the idea is whether you just succeed or just fail, that is essentially random. It's unlikely to be driven by a large active investor. Because if the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund was there, they would have dragged up the vote from 49 to 80, rather than 49 to 51. And what they found is that when these governance proposals were, were passed, then indeed there was improvements in terms of stock prices, acquisitions fell, and actually investments fell as well. And that's interesting because often people say, well, if a company cuts investment, this is really bad. Or if you're a politician in the US, you call it un-American if you really want to get some, some votes won. But actually, firm value rose even though the investment fell. So what actually this was suggesting is they were scrapping bad investments rather than cutting investments in order to make a quick buck. So that's in terms of governance. Um, let me spend a little bit of time on executive pay because that's what I opened the talk with in terms of this being a real sign of bad governance. And so a lot of the emphasis nowadays is in terms of pay ratios. Under this pie-splitting idea that the CEO is taking too much away from workers, good governance is about redistributing the pie. And indeed, we see BlackRock uh, wrote to 300 UK companies saying that it would only approve salary increases to the CEO if worker wages rose by the same amount to keep this same ratio. Not we'd approve CEO pay if she'd create a lot of value to society as well as shareholders, but if worker wages rose. And the Portland City Council in Oregon actually imposes an extra tax if your pay ratio is too high. Now, this is based, these views are partly based on some evidence. So, a few years ago, there was the House of Commons Select Committee on Corporate Governance. Uh, I was called to testify in this inquiry, and the witness before me was the Trade Union Congress. And they quoted evidence of a study which found that firm productivity is negatively correlated with pay disparity between the CEO and lower level employees. So the idea is that a high pay ratio suggests unfairness and inequality. And this was lapped up, perhaps due to confirmation bias. People do believe that an overpaid CEO is perhaps destroying value. But what they quoted was a half-finished study. The finished version, after it went through peer review and corrected its mistakes and improved its methodology, was published before the inquiry and actually found completely the opposite result. So what they found here is that employees do not perceive higher pay ratios as an inequitable outcome. We find that firm value and operating performance both increase with relative pay, which is why it's important to look at the most stringent research rather than just find any paper that supports your viewpoint. So I shouldn't be saying this as a professor, but one of the most dangerous phrases is research shows that. Because research can show whatever you want it to show, right? So the anti-vaccination movement was supposedly founded upon some research. So it's important to look at what is the highest quality evidence. Now, let me stress that evidence is not an excuse to be dogmatic, right? Evidence does not mean that there is only one right answer. So we could all agree about the characteristics of cars, their price, their fuel efficiency, um, their quality but we would make different purchasing choices 
depending on our preferences for price versus fuel efficiency. The only role of a car company is to honestly say what the price is and what the fuel emissions are so we can't have, say, a defeat device as in the Volkswagen case. Similarly here, even if um, high pay ratios were correlated with higher performance, that doesn't mean that high pay ratios are good, right? We as investors might think, well, actually, equality is more important than firm productivity. That is a fair trade-off to make. The goal of research is to put the facts on the table to, so that investors and policymakers can make the correct decisions, and different people who can reasonably disagree given some facts. So if I don't think the um, ratio of pay is the most important dimension, what do I think we might want to look at? So I think the structure of pay is really important. So saying a CEO earns five million pounds is not very informative because if she has five million in just cash, then she's not really accountable for performance. But if she has five million in shares that she has to keep for seven years, then she is an owner in the firm and has incentives to build firm value for the long term. So what this paper looked at was how much equity the CEO owns in her company. And what they found is if you have a very simple strategy of buying companies where the CEO has a large stake in her firm and shorting companies where she owns little, you'd earn 4 to 10% per year, depending on how you define a little and a lot. But your mind should already be thinking, well, is this correlation or is this causation? So how I've spun the story is, well, it's causation because the CEO, when she has more incentive, she's going to work hard and create value. But maybe causation is the other way. Maybe the CEO already knows how well her company's going to do. They typically have private information. And when the CEO knows that the firm is going to do better, maybe she goes to the board and says, pay me with shares. And if she has pessimistic an outlook on the firm, she might say to the board, can you pay me in, stock, uh, in cash? Sorry. So it's future performance that drives current pay rather than current pay driving future performance. So how did these authors get around this? Well, what they did was um, they looked at what are the cases in which incentives are more likely to matter. It's where you have weak governance, weak competition, few institutional owners, and in those settings, what they found was the effect was stronger, suggesting causality. Now, just giving the CEO shares is not going to help if those shares could be sold immediately, you could be, say, Angelo Mozilla of Countrywide, who, who allegedly wrote subprime loans, increased the stock price, and cashed out $140 million before um, the, the financial crisis. So one of the more important dimensions is the horizon of equity. How long can you um, have to hold it before you sell it? And these are my final pieces of evidence slides. And so one of them is my own paper, which looks at what happens when a CEO's equity vests. So let's say we're here in 2019 in November. And three years ago, a CEO was given equity in November 2016 with a three-year vesting period. Now, typically, CEOs are allowed to sell their shares once the vesting and holding periods expire. And they do because they want to diversify. And so what this is, this causes the CEO to care about the stock price, particularly now in November 2019. But notice what causes her to care about this now was an event that happened three years ago, the decision to grant equity. And what we found is that when the CEO is likely to sell shares, she will cut R&D, cut investment, and focus on short-term earnings targets. Now, this paper at the bottom looks at what happens when shareholders make a proposal not to separate the CEO and chairman, like in the earlier paper, but to implement long-term compensation. And they use the same regression discontinuity approach, comparing long-term proposals, which succeed with 51%, and they fail versus those with fail with 49%. So after a proposal to implement long-term compensation is implemented, what do you think happens to profitability? It drops. But it only drops in the short term. In the long term, it increases. What happens, but we, we don't just care about shareholders, we care about society. What happens to innovation? That rises. The number of patents rise. The patent citations go up, and that's a measure of the quality of patents. But also various measures of CSR. Somebody asked about data. This is from the MSCI ESG data set. 
they found that various measures of your performance with relation to the environment, customers, society, and in particular workers rise. So again, this supports the pie growing idea. So many of us here, or perhaps all of us here, are all about business serving wider society rather than just shareholders. That's why we're at an ESG conference. But what this suggests is the best way to serve wider society is not necessarily to take from investors or take from the CEO and cut their pay and redistribute it, but actually to change the structure of pay. Because when you give the CEO long-term pay, then she has a slice of the pie. Therefore, she has incentives to grow the pie by treating her workers better, because then when you have an engaged and a motivated and a well-trained workforce, then firm value in seven years is gonna go up. And so that takes me to the final slide before I open to the Q&A in terms of the implications for investors. So the first one is to highlight that corporate governance is not just for ESG investors. So over my 12 years as an academic, this has really changed. So previously, governance and ENS, they were seen as niche for just a couple of socially responsible funds. But this is critical. So it could be that an investor only cares about maximizing financial returns. But even if so, you should care about governance because this affects the likelihood of creating long-term value. And um, one of the biggest pieces of evidence against ESG investing is the idea that actually the average SI fund underperforms. But that's because, well, they might have incorrect measures of corporate governance, something based on pie splitting, like the pay ratio, rather than things like the horizon, the horizon of pay. So this means that to the extent to which you want to implement, uh, to, to choose on governance, or actually change governance, some of these pie growing ideas are, I think, more beneficial. And indeed, one of some, some good developments we've seen recently is the Council of Institutional Investors in the US and the Investment Association in the UK recently came out with new pay policy guidelines, not so much about changing the quantum of pay, but changing the structure, and in particular, trying to ensure that the CEO continues to hold shares after she departs. So one example, it could be Paul Polman of Unilever, who's left but still has to hold 500% of his salary in shares. That gives him a horizon well beyond his tenure and means that they think long term, not just for the years that they're in office. And so this is of interest to, to you more, more generally. I've just written a book about it called Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit, about responsible business, but about how investors are not the enemy, but they are the solution to the problem, how actually investor returns can be achieved together with greater value to, soci to society. And um, on the website here, I've just up updated it with many events that happened after the book was finished, such as the new pay structures um, that were, imp were recommended by the Investment Association and the CII. But thank you very much for your attention. I really look, I'm really happy to take any questions that anyone has. Merci. Um, hi, I'm Pierre-Antoine Boula. I'm here as an individual. I used to be at UBS involved in ESG matters. Um, this is uh, highly interesting, and I was wondering whether this could be applied or has been applied to um, the public sector corporate governance, considering that 25% uh, to 56% in my country of uh, GDP is actually publicly managed. So corporate, public corporate governance, grow the pie, uh, incent, incentivize um, those who govern us. Thank you. Thanks, it's, it's a good point. And I think if you think, if, if say you're a regulator, what is your regulator's objective function? It might be to prevent corporate failures like Carillions and so on. Uh, and if that is the case, that, then actually you might be over stringent in the governance regulations that you, you pass, rather than think about, well, how can we grow the pie and encourage more innovation? So I think it w in terms of you're in the public sector, what is your objective function, how you're evaluated by sort of those higher up, shouldn't be purely on, on stopping failures, but on measures such as innovation and productivity, which may not get as much emphasis as a particular failure, which causes a lot of uh, public and media attention. 
Drago Enzic, Oxfam, and Softfinance. You actually mentioned now regulatory compliance yeah. because we don't have time for long run. So you would assume that regulatory compliance, GDPR, Clean Air Act, etc., mm -hmm. is going to affect that. But that is, if you like, public concern. And is there an equivalent from private law perspective, which may be the class actions, people who litigate mm -hmm. against companies mm -hmm. to make compliance better? Yeah, so this is, again, the role of law. And I, I think the role of law is, is useful. However, law can typically lead to compliance rather than commitment. So what people can do is, is just try to do the minimum possible to satisfy the law. So one example, I'm sorry to go back to the pay ratio thing, but I think it's important, is that you can improve your pay ratio by paying your workers more, but not thinking about things such as skills development or a, a um, healthy place to work. So famously, um, Henry Ford paid $5 a day, yet the workers were on an assembly line with little chance of, of skills development or um, meaningful, meaningful work there. So I think this is why it again goes back to incentives, because like incentives, that that's what gives you um, the desire to be actually truly committed to it rather than just compliant. So when a CEO is thinking about the long term, um, then she will indeed think about well how to best motivate workers because the evidence that Henri mentioned in the, in the first part is there is a link between employee satisfaction and long-term returns. So I think these nudges are, are beneficial. And this is also why I think the investor community has a large role to play in terms of improving corporate governance rather than having some heavy-handed code. And the old, or another problem with legislation is that might be one size fits all. It might not recognize that a seemingly bad practice might be appropriate in a given circumstance. Yeah, well, so again, with, with litigation, it, you, you don't know what, um, sometimes litigation will look at errors of commission. So it might be if there's an overpaid CEO, then you might have a, a, an issue there, but it could be that the pay is actually justified given a lot of value creation. So again, these things might be driven by pie splitting rather than pie growing. Hi. Yep. Sure. Go ahead. Yep. Thank you uh, very much for your talk. Uh, it's Robert Smith here from... Barclays. Uh, thank you. Um, yes. You talked about investors, you know, having a role to play in, in I guess, shaping that, that corporate mm -hmm. governance of, of those companies. But talking, I guess, particularly about um, executive compensation, mm -hmm. given that, you know, many shareholder votes aren't actually binding, how strong do you think kind of that power is? Yeah, so I think the power is, is, is quite strong. So what's interesting about, um, uh, w about say, on pay is uh, when Theresa May stood for um, her uh, prime minister, she said, well, I'm going to come in and make say, on pay binding. And most people think, oh, well, binding say, on pay, that gives you much more, much more power. But actually, again, it, what's useful is to look at the evidence. And so there was a study um, in the Journal of Financial Economics which looked at countries around the world and um, looked at ones in which say on pay was binding and ones in which say on pay was advisory. And they found that actually advisory say on pay was more effective at uh, both reducing the level of pay and tying it more strongly to performance. Now, the differences were not huge, but there were some differences there. And so one interpretation of this is actually if, if say on pay is binding, then investors might be less willing to, to vote against something because it might cause a lot of disruption if, if you can't pass your, your pay law. And so that's why I think evidence is, is really useful. And so I actually give Theresa May credit for um, doing a U-turn on this. Now, whenever people do U-turns, then the media gets angry, but instead what happened was there was a public consultation. There were people who submitted the evidence, and perhaps based on that, then they rethought it. So I think, well, what is the other way in which, say, investors can, can, can improve things other than, say, on pay? It might actually be to change their own investment, um, so how their own compensation. So how investment managers are paid when that is according to the long term and when that is when they have a lot of skin in the game, then they will have incentives to hold companies to account for these longer term things such as development of human capital. Henri was rather modest, but he has a paper himself in the Journal of Financial Economics which shows that the greater the stake that a mutual fund manager has, in her, own, in her own fund, the greater the performance. And so that sort of makes sense, is that then you do have the incentives to monitor rather than perhaps be spread too thinly and engage in, say, tick box governance. Yeah, um, yeah go ahead. Oh, OK, sure. Hi, this is Pierre from HSBC Asset Management. Um, I'm curious to know your views on share buybacks, because uh, I agree the pay structure is important, but a CEO who is being paid with shares, mm. they have all the incentives to do share buybacks and it's not to return sh uh, uh, value to shareholders, it's actually to pay for himself the, the shares in the future. 
So I'm not sure about the incentives of share buybacks, how it works. I could probably speak for one hour on share buybacks. I only have a couple of minutes because of the break. But again, this is a topic where the, the evidence is really misportrayed. So the, the, the idea is a share buyback is perhaps the second most evil thing about companies after CEO pay. You engage in a buyback in order to boost your pay. You take money away from workers and you take money away from investment. That's what people believe. If you look at the evidence, there was a seminal study in 1995 showing that the stock price increases um, when um, a share buyback happens and it continues to go up. So that's against the idea that it's temporary and it goes down. That study was in 1995. It was redone by the same guy, Theo Vermeulen, in 2018, looking around the world, not just in the US, and also the results still held. The, U the UK government actually commissioned a study on the alleged misuse of share buybacks that was part of the manifesto promise, and that study was done by both me and PwC, one of the other authors, Tom Gosling, I believe, is in the audience. And what we found was there was not a single case in the 10-year period that we studied in which share buybacks were used in order to hit an executive pay target. So there were no cases in which the company hit the target where it would not have hit the target without the share buyback. And so that study is available on the government website, but on the LBS website, if you don't want to pour through 150 pages, there's a simple sort of summary of, of that um, on the website. I have a chapter about this in, in my book. So share buybacks might be a concern, right? You might think this is at the expense of, of investment, but actually the evidence suggests that they're actually good in terms of returning capital rather than wasting capital. And where does that capital go? It doesn't get wasted. It can be reallocated to other businesses and finance and small enterprises. Thank you very much. I'm sorry couldn't I get to all the questions. Well, I'll, I'll be around in, in the break and very happy to take the questions then. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thanks. Thanks.